Put up a word of prayer this morning. We jump into God's word. Father, I pray that you will still our hearts and our thoughts, our worries this morning. The many things you've brought uh, into our lives, our opportunities to, to give them back to you, to trust you with them. So Father, uh, right now, we lay down our burdens, we lay down our fears and our anxieties, we lay down the, the, the weights we carry around most other days, and acknowledge you as the supreme uh, one, the supreme ruler in our lives, and, and also as our Father, one who wants what's best for us. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to uh, pick up faith, to acknowledge you're the one who, who gives those things to us, and that we can accept your word right now in faith that you are fighting for us even today, and that everyone who is here has been brought by you to hear a specific word today, and I pray that you would allow me to preach your word and not uh, get in the way of what you want to do, and we would just see your name glorified through this time. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So today, uh, we are going to be jumping through a, a bunch of 1 Corinthians 7. We're uh, working on a series through the book of Corinthians right now, and that's called United in Christ. We're talking about the things that, uh, that uh, should unite us as members of the body, and yet the things that often divide us. Um, and uh, so far, we've talked about a, a bunch of different um, difficult things. But today, we're going to be talking about um, some more personal issues. We're going to be talking about three topics, which Paul covers all in one chapter, uh, the, the topics of uh, marriage, divorce, and singleness. Uh, so I confess, that is a lot for one sermon, and I can't get into everything, uh, but what I want to do is I want to talk about it, at least from a perspective that Paul introduces us to the topic. And once again, that these uh, sermons should be jumping off points for further discussion, an opportunity to examine where you're at in your own lives on these topics, and not so much as a, as a, as a holistic explanation of everything. You will have questions, and I, and I hope this is an opportunity for us to, to dive deeper after this. Um, I'm going to go ahead by, by just reading the verses out to us this morning, at least the first 15 verses, uh, and then we're going we're gonna to jump in a little further. So, about the things you wrote, it is good for a man not to have relations with a woman, but because of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. A husband should, should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise, a wife to her husband. A wife does not have authority over her own body, but her husband does. Equally, a husband does not have authority over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another, except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people were just like me, but each has his own gift from God, one this and another that. I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain as I am, but if they do not have self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with desire. I command the married, not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to leave her husband, but if she does sleep, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to leave his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has an unbelieving wife, and she is willing to live with him, he must not leave her. Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband, and he is willing to live with her, she must not leave her husband. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the Christian husband, otherwise her children would be unclean. But, how, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him leave. A brother or a sister is not bound in such cases. God has called you to peace. For you, wife, how do you know whether you will save your husband, or you, husband, how do you know whether you will save your wife? So, there's a lot in there, uh, and I want to start off, I was, I was watching the movie um, Les Miserables, uh, the, of the, the novel by Victor Hugo, the French author, um, and it's, it's interesting, um, early, earlier this week, and I was just kind of thinking about, the, as, as the week went on, how the love story uh, really stuck out to me. There's this love story between these, this young, I mean, there's multiple kind of stories going on throughout, but there's there's this one story that kind of 
um, takes center stage as, as the, the book moves along between this guy named Marius and this uh, young lady named Cosette. And at one point, they're, they're having this, and of course the movie, it's a, it's a musical, right? People are singing and getting into it. People are singing over each other. It's great, right? Um, if you're into that kind of thing. I'm not. It's fine. Um, but like, so, so I was watching, and so there's this, so, so Marius sees Cosette across the way, and was like, and Cosette sees him and is like, dang, but I have to go follow my, my dad. No way. And she does, right? And, the, and Mary's just like, goes to this girl named Epony, Epony and she's like, hey, you got to go find out who that girl is for me. Like, I am smitten. My life doesn't make sense anymore unless I have this girl. And she's like, and I think this is it, but she's in love with Marius, and so she's torn over her over her experience of being in love and not having the guy that she wants, and, and, and kind of this year after year existence of not being able to have the love she wants in her life, and all of a sudden he's in love with this other girl, which just apparently just happens. Like it's this epic romantic love story that most Americans sort of believe is true, um, thanks to stories like this. And, and then uh, she, being the good friend, goes and finds Cosette, shows Marius where she's at, and they come together and they have this big story where they're singing about how they don't know each other, but how their lives will never be the same again because they found this, this true love story, right? And so it occurred to me earlier this week that as I'm watching this, we have a lot of what we are going to talk about today represented right in that little song. It's the, it's the human desire for love and relationship and intimacy. The, the longing and the desire to find it. And the sometimes thinking we have absolutely found it. Right? And sometimes, as many people know, once you have found it, it doesn't mean you wake up feeling that way for the rest of your life, every single minute and every single hour. And I guess it points us back to this idea that relationships are complicated. Right? Like, the way we experience them in movies or even in our own heads is often not the way they actually play out in real life. And as we jump into chapter 7 today, I want us to point out that Paul is going to be talking about sex right away, right? But I want us to remember that while he's using, we've been talking a lot about sex throughout 1 Corinthians, but it's not primarily about sex. What Paul's doing right now is he's using sex as a vehicle to talk about the way we experience, pursue, and, and, and ought to understand human love in light of what Christ has done for us and what it means to be a believer and a follower of Christ in the New Testament. So he starts off with this first line, 7-1. Now, for the matter uh, you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. And I think uh, most people's first reaction is like, well, that's... That's not cool. Like that's, that's not very fun. Um, but we have to remember that this, this letter, what we're reading here, is a response that Paul has received other letters before. He's been in ongoing communication with the church in Corinth, and that is a quote. It is good for a man not to have relations with a woman. He's saying, you wrote that to me. That was something that was part of the last letter. And we're reminded that we've actually already seen this. Um, that in, in verse 612, Paul says, when, when we get that famous line, says, I have the right to do anything, but I won't be mastered by anything. Right? That's Paul saying, and that, that I have a right to do anything, that's also a quote. And what Paul's kind of pointing to is that there are multiple views, just like there was uh, in Corinth, and there is today, we have sort of these extremes of, of understanding of how sex and intimate relationship works. On one end, we sort of have the, I have a right to do anything argument, right? That's a lot about the, that sex and, and marriage is primarily about instincts, right? You're basically an animal, and, and you're living out of those because that's what you should do. That's what animals do. There's nothing wrong with it. But Paul argues back that actually, when we simply live that way, we actually miss out on this very uh, innate part of our, of our humanity, that is the spiritual side of it. That there's something about spiritual health that, that comes into play, and that we shouldn't be mastered by anything, right? Now, I talked about that a lot, a lot the last two weeks, so I won't, I won't belabor the point. If you want to more, hear more about what I have to say about that, you can go watch on our YouTube channel um, about, the, about that. But when Paul goes on, he says, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. We're, we're recognizing this is sort of the opposite end of that, right? This is sort of the, like, 
sex is dirty, right? Like we don't really want to talk about it. It's kind of gross. Like let's just like let's pretend it's not a thing, and then and then babies just show up, right? Um, oh, surprise, right? It's great. Like that we we that some people would just rather it not be an issue. So so if the first view was sort of like sex is fine, it's just animal instinct, do whatever feels good, and, and we're just animals. This is sort of the opposite end of it that's like, no, like sex is dirty, it's just of the body. We're spiritual beings. We shouldn't be burdened down by, by those things, right? And Paul's actually kind of calling us back to this very middle ground that says, like, no, no, but like we are physical beings, right? Like that's true. But but we're also spiritual beings. And, and actually, we need to remember that the unification of those two things is actually innately part of what it means to be human. And so we have to have real conversations about what sex and marriage and intimacy ought to look like. And so he goes on in, in verse 2. He says, but because of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife. And each woman should have her own husband. And they should fulfill their marital duty to one another, right? And while this may not sound progressive, I think it's important to start with this understanding. In that day, this was an incredibly progressive statement. Okay? Um, the rule, the letter of the law, this, in, in this culture, women were more or less possessions, more, more than anything, right? Not allowed to testify um, in court because their, their, their testimony couldn't be trusted, right? Men were the one who provided, they were the one who owned, owned property, who received the inheritance, and women were kind of like, hey, Better latch on to one of those guys, right? Uh, because otherwise you're in trouble. And, and so Paul says, the wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but yields to the husband. And that's the way it had always been. But then he goes on, he says, in the same way, a husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife, right? And, and Paul's, what Paul's asking us to do is to reconsider the way that we've already always seen marriage to that culture. Say, I want you to reconsider it in light of, of Christ, in light of the gospel, and in light of what marriage is actually supposed to represent to the Christian. And so, but I think uh, some of us, at least in our culture, we're tempted to sort of read this, right, and, and say, Jordan, I don't know that Paul was actually that progressive, right? Like, we all, we've all heard at least the first line of 1 Corinthians 5 quoted to us before, right? Or not sorry, the first line, but verse 22 says, wives submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord, right? And everybody throws up a little bit. Um, because that's how we've sort of been conditioned to hear Paul's words here. That this is primarily about uh, uh, marriage being a, a, a masculine created uh, entity and keep it that way, right? Um, but we can't, but, but, but we need to remember that he actually goes on. He doesn't stop there when Paul's describing uh, what marriage actually is for the Christian. He's not treating uh, women as second-class citizens, but he's drawing them into this bigger picture that he's painting for us. He says, for the, he does say, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And this is Ephesians 5, if you want to follow along. I'm sorry, I'm going to slide up here. But, uh, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. But then he keeps going. He says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up to her, for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, right? So what, what Paul is doing is he's rooting this whole idea of marriage. And he's saying, this is the way you've seen it. Now, this is the way it actually is in Christ. Now, this is what Jesus did for the, ch for the church, all right? He led, he loved, he served. And, and, and marriage had rarely been recognized as this movement between two equally valuable people, right? And so we have roles in marriage, but these roles aren't related to inherent value of one individual over another, right? And, and uh, we're told that in, in in the, in the gospel, in this image here, we're told that we are, uh, actually just take us back to Genesis, we're, made that, we're reminded that we're a small image of the God we worship, right? So God is created three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which means God himself is a love relationship, right? There is love being intimately shared between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all the time, all right? And within that, there is this weird hierarchy, and I'm not going to belabor 
this idea of gender roles, and, 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 and I really don't mean to. And so if you have questions about it, like, please email me, call me, we can have a conversation about it, like, it's fine. Um, uh, and, but I'm going to be preaching on it more in a couple weeks, so I don't want to blame it at the point here. But I want to point out that in the Gospel, Jesus says that I and the Father are one, right? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He says, I've been sent, and yet he also says, I've been sent to do the Father's will. I speak his words, right? Jesus lives in deference to the Father, right? But he, he, we see this when he's in the garden, right? He's been beaten, he's been tortured, he's on his way to death, and yet he says, Father, if this cup can pass from me, I'm asking it to pass. But also, not my will, but yours be done, right? So this is, the fancy word for it is called subordinationalism, right? But, but the point is that, like, Jesus and the Father are equal. They are both God. They are both powerful. They are both fully able and capable. Yet there is this weird authority of deference within the Trinity, right? And that somehow marriage is supposed to reflect this type of eternal, endless generosity, right? And this is actually cool because in Christian marriage, there are men and, uh, and women, but they both actually have one person that they're imaging, right? Paul seems to be saying... And you can disagree with me, but Paul, Paul seems to be saying that, like men, you need to look at what Jesus does. He leaves the church. He brings the word. He sacrifices his life for the, for the life of his beloved. He gives all of himself in service so that another might be loved. And to the woman, he's saying, you too need to be like Jesus who knew the Father, who was able to trust in the Father's love, who submitted himself to, to the love of the Father, that both men and women are called to go, what was Jesus like? And I want to be like him. And in this, there's this unity based upon not power, but love. Choosing, choice, generosity, service, that that's the root, and that's so hard for us to hear because anytime we hear something like submission, we hear power, we hear authority, and not a good kind, we hear abusive kind, right? And this is scary, and I fully, actually, I can, I can relate, I can understand how scary that is. But Paul says, he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. Christ is bringing it back, saying, marriage is like this bigger body. For this reason, a, father, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So Paul roots Christian marriage in this deeper love relationship of Christ to the church, and you probably recognize there that Paul is quoting Genesis 2.24 in Ephesians. The two shall become one flesh, and a man will leave his father and mother, right? And what we want to point out is, this is when, when Paul says... The two will become one flesh. This is more than Paul saying, hey, uh, people will get married and then they will be married. Or they will uh, have sex and thus they have had sex. Right? He's not, he's not saying that. This word one flesh, to be cleaved to one another, it's, it's, it's more like they're one organism. Right? It's more like, it's like taking the, like, uh, sodium chloride, like, of salt, right? And, and, like, they're different things and you put them together and they become something entirely new. They are both, they're merged into something other than they could have been on their own, and they're better for it, right? That there's something beautiful about two becoming one, and that we're made for it in light of who God is and who we are in His image, right? So the Christian marriage then is this small mirror of what Christ has done for humanity, where Christ died, gave himself to the church so that he might redeem and love them. And this is what husband and wife are called to do for each other cyclically, right? Again and again and again to love one another in a way where the other experiences the love of God through complete vulnerability, physically, socially, economically, right? Oneness is complete in how they live with and for one another in light of what God has done, right? And in this way, sex becomes, it's, it's sort of this renewal covenant ceremony, right? It's, it's like each time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, what we're doing is we're taking the body and the blood. We are saying Christ is meeting with us again. We are meeting with Christ in the elements and knowing that he is forgiving us. We're already forgiven, but he's forgiving us afresh. We are reenacting the covenant, right, that he has given us.
And that's really what sex in a lot of ways is. It's this, it's this re-covenant ceremony of what we've committed to with one another in light of what God has done for us, right? Now, the question should be asked, right? If we're designed for this kind of unity, why would Paul ever go on as he does in verse 7 and say, I wish that all of you were as I am, right? That seems like a dumb thing, right? If we're made in light of a Trinitarian God who loves endlessly and we are supposed to love like that and we have a hunger and a craving inside us for that, why would Paul ever be like, yes, also, I hope you never get it. It seems just really kind of mean, right? Like, oh, love's so great, I hope you never experience it. <laughs> no, I don't think Paul does that, right? So, he goes on, though, and he says, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Verse 8, now to the unmarried and the widow, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And we should probably point out that there's something reasonable here um, it, about, about understanding that there might be, there might be a difference between um, a celibate, a calling to celibacy, right, and, and being single for a time, right, um, as a gifting, right? So Paul, Paul, may, Paul may be saying, I have this spiritual gift. In, in verse 7, I think he says, um, I wish that all people were just like me, but each has his own gift from God, right? Paul's saying, I seem to have this gift of celibacy, right? Like, this is something I think God's given me, like I'm called to this, this is something that's really true. But, but beyond that, I think it's important to point out that Paul's actually recognizing we're all called to that at a time, right? Whether, whether we haven't gotten married yet, or, or maybe there's even a time, you know, maybe your spouse has passed away, or, or maybe even just you're married, but there's a time of, uh, you know, sickness or something like that, and you can't, you can't have that, that uh, renewal ceremony regularly. There's this time of celibacy where we all experience those things, right? But beyond that, it's probably worth affirming that the desire to get married, the desire to have those, that, that type of physical, mental, emotional, social engagement through marriage is a good thing. But I think where we get in trouble is that we forget that, that, uh, that marriage isn't the goal, okay? Um, and this is sort of what I mean. I, I, I started talking about a, a little bit today um, at the beginning of our, of our uh, service by talking about like love stories like Les Miserables, right? This, 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 this sort of endless love saga, right? And, and, and this is the truth. Each era has reason to be in love with love, right? Uh, in Paul's time, there was no social security. There was no like... There was no welfare system. So if you didn't have a, a spouse and children to take care of you, you were in a bad way, okay? So there was a huge emphasis upon legacy, about having kids, about having financial and social provision in your old age. But in our age, it's not so much like that. We still have the same, the same pressures, right? Like, I remember, and I know this dates me, but like I remember when like Jerry Maguire was a big thing, right? I'm like in middle school. People are walking around being like, you can believe me. <laughs> Tear. Right? Because, because we see the story and we're like, I want that story too. I, when I, was, I remember a substitute teaching a number of years ago. This is probably seven, eight years ago now. I remember it was when the Twilight Saga was huge. And it was like, it was so weird. Like, I would just sit there and listen to these teenage girls who were like, with their like neon green eyeliner and like pink and green like rubber bands on their braces, like talking about how like hot vampire is, or their like werewolf crush, being like, I wish that I could truly fall in love with someone who would want to drink my blood too, and then I would really be happy, right? Then I would finally find wholeness. That somehow, like these stories, somehow that makes sense, right? Because there's at least something in there about desire and wanting to be wanted and known and cared for, and we love it, and we could, we like... We, we celebrate it, right? We, we sing about it, we talk about it, and somehow we believe that this will make us happy. And, and the truth is, actually, the church hasn't done a, a very good job of talking about singleness. I know. It's easy to believe some of those same stories because we followed a similar narrative. There's this um, article by this woman named Paige Brenton Brown. It's, it's, it's old now, but 
she talks about some of her experiences being a single woman in her 30s, and she says, I long to get married. My younger sister got married two months ago. She now has an adoring husband, a beautiful home, a, world, a whirlpool bathtub, and all-new porting wear. Is God being less good to me than he is to her? The answer is no. But she goes on to say that she often hears all these reasons that aren't necessarily biblical for why she's single. And we, we talk about singleness like this. She says, sometimes the line is, as soon as you're satisfied with God alone, he'll bring someone special into your life. As though God's, blessing are, er, God's blessings are earned by our contentment. No, I don't need it. And God's like, well, you can have it. Right? Or you're too picky. As though God's like, you just, I can't find anybody for you. Right? You have your, your standards are too high, lower them, and then maybe I can provide something. I got, I, got, I got to have some room to work here, right? Or as a single, you can commit yourself wholeheartedly to the Lord's work. As though God can't use, like, as, as though God can only use people who become emotional martyrs. Like, I know marriage would make me happy, but God needs someone to be sad all the time so they can serve in the kingdom. I guess it'll be me. That's not true. That's not true, but somehow we believe that. We talk about it like that, right? Before you can marry someone wonderful, the Lord has to make you someone wonderful. As though God's like, you are now good enough. You are a nice enough person where someone will marry you. You were pretty rough before, right? But that's so, that so undermines the gospel, right? Like, it's not true. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel is that we all fall short of the glory of God, that we are all sinful people, that we keep sinning against and hurting one another, and it undermines the history of the church. All the people who've served the Lord, been used by the Lord, love the Lord, whether married or single, there's not, uh, there's not just a pattern, right? She goes on, she says, accepting singleness, whether temporary or permanent, does not hinge on speculation, speculation about answers God has not given to our list of wives, but rather a celebration of the life he has given. I am not single because I am too spiritually unstable to possibly deserve a husband, nor because I am too spiritually mature to possibly need one. I am single because God is so abundantly good to me, because this is his best for me. Singleness, in this way, is in a state of deprivation, right? But we also have to remember that neither is marriage a state of fulfillment, right? Um, when we get into these apocalyptic love stories like I was talking about, we, forget, we, 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 we all know it, right? Like, we all know it, even if we don't acknowledge it, that the stories end at, like, really nice points. Yay, they're married, kisses and rice and credits, right? And, or like, or, or, you know, like the first kiss finally happened, it all came together, and like that's where we want to celebrate, that's where we want to end the story, because that's where it's happening, because we know that actually going on from there, like if you showed the, like, story three years later where they're having, like, trouble, and the husband's put on some weight, he's less attractive, and the wife's lost her job, and they're having financial trouble, and they're kind of bickering at each other, and like, laying in bed facing the other way at night, like, it wouldn't be a very good story, right? But, like, what we forget is that in marriage, when you marry someone, you marry a person. Not, not, a, not, a, not a fairy tale, right? You marry a person, and Scripture tells us that people have issues. Paul says in verse 28, which I didn't get this up here, so I don't think, he says, those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you, okay? The truth is, I, I like this line, Timothy Kelly talks about this, and I think Stanley Howard does too, he's, he's, he talks about how in your life, if you are married, you will be married to several different people, right? And hopefully they will all be your spouse, all right? But that life changes you. The person you marry when you're 18 or 20 or 24 is not the same person you will be married to when they're 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 when they have kids, are employed in a certain job, or aren't, are sick, or are healthy, people are not the same, right? You will change. And so when we talk about marriage and when we talk about singleness, we talk about choosing people who are not template-driven, right? You can't just be like, I found this one. Boom. Done. Right? And when it comes to divorce, we understand that People sometimes face that situation. That's really hard. Where they go, man, the fairy tale is not what I thought it would be. This is, this is gross. All right? I don't want to be here. I have questions. And Paul says to the married in verse 10, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does, she must 
must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. And I have every sympathy for this. I, I, I come from a, a, a divorced family. Um, and people who are in it or people who have seen it, you know that marriages can be rough. I, I, I'm not going to pretend like this is an easy verse. Like I could just throw a law at you and be like, get it together. All right. God bless you. See you later. It's not that simple. We know it's hard. But once again, we have to realize that what Paul is teaching here, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than what we see. Okay? What we have to realize is that people were coming out of a Deuteronomy 24 history, which is basically that we read that in Deuteronomy 24, a husband could say to his wife, you displease me. Here is your certificate of divorce. Go and do whatever seems best to you. Right? A husband had this authority just to divorce his wife if she upset him. Right? That's the culture Jesus and Paul are operating in. And once again, Paul says, no. Once again, husbands and wives have rights, and you can't do this to each other because that's not what Christ has done for the church. That's not what marriage is to you anymore. We are switching paradigms from the one you were living into the one Jesus says he's made for you. Right? Jesus gives us the same story in Matthew 19. We, we we're told a story about how these Pharisees come to him, and they have their own opinions on marriage. We're told this is a little bit of a trap, right? The Pharisees come to him and say, hey, uh, Jesus, can, uh, can, people, can people get divorced? And Jesus is like, you've read Genesis. Two people come together, what God has created, let no man separate. And they're like, hey, but, but in Deuteronomy it says, it says people can get divorced in your face, Jesus. All right? And Jesus is like, look, look, stop. All right? Moses allowed that. God has given you an allowance there, but it doesn't make it good. He's given you an allowance, but you have that allowance because your hearts are hard. Because you've forgotten that love, that marriage, is rooted in something deeper than yourself. Your own feelings, your own satisfaction right now. And because your hearts are hard, God has allowed this for you. But that's not the way it was in the beginning. And that's not the way it should be for believers either. But he does give this one caveat. He says, except for reasons of sexual immorality. And this leaves us with a little question, right? He's saying that at one point you made vows in front of your friends and your family and God. And you invited your spouse and God into this relationship with you. And so Jesus is recognizing that to be married with some married to somebody else, if you move beyond that, you would be committing adultery, right? Yet there is this reason for divorce. And, and, and we should recognize that sometimes, just like Jesus affirms, divorce is a real thing, even in the church. Okay? There's this article by Kevin DeYoung, and I realize I'm citing all sorts of names today. Forgive me, and feel free to ignore them. Um, but he says it this way. <clears throat> Remember the Christmas story. When Joseph, who was engaged to Mary, found that she was with child, the text says, because Joseph was a righteous man, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. The first thing we notice is that Joseph had to divorce Mary, even though they were only engaged, and that Jewish betrothals were legally binding in the first century. But leaving that aside, we also see that Joseph was considered righteous for divorcing her quietly. He is commended for the quietness, mostly, but the divorce didn't, uh, Mostly, but it didn't seem to reflect badly on Joseph. Mary was thought had committed sexual immorality, and so Joseph was considered righteous for divorcing her quietly. We get a similar story in the Old Testament. In Jeremiah, we read that, that God says to Israel, I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of her adulteries. That marriage is something covenantal. It's, it's an absolute choosing. And when people break that, that might be grounds for divorce. But the truth is, we need to be careful. Because we can easily extend this beyond the borders that we're given. Jesus says, porneia is, is a reason. That's the Greek word for this, for this general catch-all phrase about sexual immorality, right? Anything outside of what God has laid down in Genesis, that falls outside. That's porneia. That could be reason for divorce. And Paul gives us a second one in verses 12 through 16 of verse 7. He says, but to the rest... Not I, but so if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she is willing to live with him, he must not leave her. Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he is willing to live with her, she must not leave her alone. 
And he kind of gives this, but if the unbeliever leaves, let him leave. A brother or sister is not bound in such cases. And so here Paul gives us the second allowance divorce. And this is namely when an unbelieving spouse does not want to be in the relationship anymore. That we should try to live at peace with that person. And that while divorce is never preferable, right? Because God might do something through that relationship to bring your unbelieving spouse to faith. That you shouldn't try to hold that, right? But we're left with this question, is, and this is what people argue today, right? What constitutes infidelity in fact? Jesus said infidelity is reason, but is pornography infidelity? What about an inappropriate emotional relationship? Porn use once is that to be porn addiction? At what point is it enough, Jesus? Where's the line where I can get divorced? We ask the same thing about this, this, this text here in 1 Corinthians. We, we want to say, we want to say, yeah, but, but when? Like, what is abandonment? Do they have to be gone for a day, a week, a month, a year? Can, can they abandon me emotionally? Can they abandon me financially? At what point can I say abandonment is enough? Because I, I think there's a reason that we're not actually given every single answer. Because I think when we ask those questions, we're asking the wrong questions. Jesus says, when we're asking those questions, we're losing sight of the reason we were in it in the first place. We're losing sight of what the gospel and marriage is all about. It's about being in a, in a singularly loving, sacrificial relationship as Jesus gave us. Once again, Kevin DeYoung just said it this way, he says, let me just add that I'm sympathetic to and yet extremely cautious about finding other grounds for divorce. No. On the one hand, I think it's possible that God did not mean to give us every possible grounds for divorce in the New Testament. Jesus gave one, and Paul, admittedly under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, mentioned another, one relevant to the Corinthian situation. So might there be one or two grounds for divorce? One or two more? Perhaps. And yet, if you say that you open up, if you say that you open up Pandora's box of trouble. People will argue that psychological abuse is grounds for emotional, and, and, and emotional neglect is a ground, and maybe terrible unhappiness is a ground for divorce. I think it's safer biblically to maintain that there are two acceptable grounds for divorce. But having said that, I can envision in extreme situations, the elder might conclude this man or woman has not completely disappeared, but his life is tantamount to desertion. If a guy is strung out on drugs, gambling all their worldly possessions, and has repeatedly beaten his wife, might that not count at some point of desertion? This is why each case needs to be dealt with individually. And it's also why we need biblical principles to be able to sit down and wrestle with texts like this and know that we need to ultimately bring this to God's word and trust him to be faithful in our lack of knowledge to help us wrestle with these difficult situations. And I'll, I, know, I know we're covering a lot of ground here today. And I want to wrap up pretty quick. But Paul, in verse 29, says... What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they did not have wives. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use the thank you, world as though they did not make full use of it. For this world in its current form is passing away. He talks about how when we're married, we can be consumed with the things of marriage. Right? How there's freedom and singleness to serve, but that whether you're single or married, we need to look back at the state of this world. We need to have an eternal perspective in the way we approach relationships instead of a temporal perspective in how we experience something good or bad as it relates to us. There's this, um, there's this verse in Revelation 21, and I just want to read you a couple, a couple verses as we finish. He says, <clears throat> I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were completely gone. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. It was coming down out of the heaven from God. It was prepared like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne that said, Look, God now makes his home with the people, and he will live with them. They will be his temple, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. There will be no more death. There will be no more sadness. There will be no more crying or pain. Things are no longer the way they used to be. I want to end today 
with an attempt at remembering that marriage and singleness are not about you finding your ultimate fulfillment. That human relationships, while we have practiced throughout time, the practice of what makes me happy, therefore I go to that, right? Culturally, financially, whatever the case be, often marriage is looked at as, what can I get to get mine? Jesus, Paul, his word, is taking marriage and flipping it on its head and said, what if marriage and singleness were both a reflection of generous love, a giving of oneself for and to the world, just like Jesus? Some of us want to be in relationships. Some of us want to be out of relationships. Neither is looking at Jesus necessarily as the whole. I can't, I can't answer that question for you, and, and only you can do that. But I want to remind us today that we are called to something bigger, and, and actually the hard part about that is that something bigger is sitting next to you in the aisle. This little church, the people out there, need to hear about the love of Christ, and that you are called to the body of Christ, which means a oneness and a unity that should affect your life. And if it doesn't, I'm not laying a guilt trip. I just I, I, I want you to consider that for yourselves. Is the body the unity I'm seeking to experience, or is it something else? Because we we all need Christ to actually come in, convict us of our sin, and draw us into a deeper relationship than often we're willing to look for. Let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, um, Lord, I pray that you will uh, speak to us uh, through your words and through this message. That you will help the things that are helpful to stick and help the things that aren't helpful to just go away. But Lord, I, I pray today that you will help us to remember that we are called to a new type of marriage. It's a, it's a marriage in the body of Christ. An acknowledgement that we are loved endlessly by the one from whom life, love itself flows. That we can trust our marriages for reconciliation. We can trust our singleness and hope of marriage. Or we can trust our singleness and hope of a single call into the Lord at any given time because we know that Christ is bigger than any human relationship. And He is the one that's redeeming and making all things new. We pray these things in Jesus' name.